Um, okay, so this is just going to be a, a tooling walkthrough for um, some stuff to, as I said, uh, just reverse engineer comms from a, in this case, really simple uh, wireless device uh, to doorbell multiple tone um, using uh, PACRF for capture, in spectrum for initial analysis, just to figure out what's going on with the digital modes, and then uh, using RFCAT to actually talk to the device. So rather than having to deal with SDR for talking to the device, we go, we've got hardware that can do basic digital modulation for us, let the hardware do it. So this is the dinky doorbell. There are two functions on the remote. Ring the bell or change the tune. So and that'll then play the next tune. Da, 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 da. Or change the tune again. Um, so with uh, with many devices in the States, you can crack them open and find a bunch of FCC identifiers, so the regulatory info. Um, look that up on FCC.io. So put in the, um, the FCC approval numbers and that'll take you to a lot of useful information about frequency they transmit at, modulations, enough stuff to get you, like to get you started. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, this apparently isn't sold in the States or at least isn't approved for sale in the States. So there's no FCC identifiers. So starting you know, either with a device where you've got no information about what it is or something where you don't have physical access to the transmit and receive endpoints, so you can't find out what they are. Um, you've got to start off with a guess. This being a uh, you know simple off-the-shelf device, it's presumably operating in uh, you know, 433 range is the obvious starting guess. So, uh, uh, come on, pop to the front. Okay. So let's say we start at 433. We want a, uh, is that 20 meg? Uh, yep. So we want a nice, as wide a capture as we can, because at this point we're just going, what frequency is it using? So where do we need to do our more uh, more detailed capture? So uh, yes, so it is. Uh, so stop that. Uh, stop the capture. No, we want a nice wide. Nice wide capture and then go, cool. So there is a, obviously it's cheap and nasty, so there's junk all over the place. But the largest peak is this one at around about 434. Let's go in for a closer look. And then, yeah, okay, so now two meg around 434. Uh, uh, why am I not? Uh, is this. Yeah, that's not the offset that I wanted. For those who are new to GQRX. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone knows G G GQRX just as a um, sort of first step tool. Yeah. So this is a live display of um, input from the HackRF, is the device I'm using for capture. Um, And you can set your frequency at the top. Yeah, so the, the yeah, so there's um, 
while we're not using it for input for actually, so you can set it to demodulate a bunch of um, you know, analog modes. And so the interesting capture, so the this here sets the tuned frequency of the radio, and then there's a separate offset um, for where it will actually look for the signal that you're trying to deal with. Uh, the reason for the offset is to um, avoid a, any DC spike due to shoddy, well not shoddy, but just due to ADC issues in the hardware. Um, so that's more like it. So it's pretty clearly transmitting, you know, I'm going to call it 434 um, as the expected. It's cheap. Oh, okay. So this device, when you, it's unpowered, except when you press the button. When you press the button, it charges a cap and then runs for as long as it can. Um, hence the not fantastic signal towards the end of that. So that's gotten us to the point of going, we're transmitting on 434, um, at which point we can take a closer look. So let's just go to 10 uh, There we go. Um, so I'm now gonna do a capture for that, well, a capture to look at in, in Spectrum, um, which will give us more information about what we're actually, or what's actually happening um, in that signal. So, let's see, uh, uh, CSA frequency uh, four. So, capturing. Yeah, so I don't want to capture right on the frequency that it's transmitting because the DC offset in the um, in the receiver will potentially interfere with the signal. So you want to capture offset a bit. Um, the DC signal you can then ignore and so capture the interesting signal at some small offset. And if it's FSK, you want to be offset by more than the deviation. You know, basically, you want to keep all the interesting stuff away from the actual tuning point of the radio. Yes, yes I do. This is that as small with the uh, little RTL SDRs. Yeah. A huge, huge DC spike, um, which is what you get for cheap, um, cheap ADCs. So I'm just going to, uh, that's, well, like, so I'm not setting any amplification options, just using the defaults. That's good enough because I'm right next to it. If you're trying to capture something from further away or whatever, you might have to, you know, directional antenna or whatever. So uh, what I'm going to do is start capturing and then send, I don't know, say five of the ring signal and then five of the change tune signal. Um, and that'll give us a bunch of info in our capture file that we can then look at to see uh, what's actually happening on the air. So one, two, four, five, two, three, four, five of them. Okay, so this capture file now, uh, the CS8 um, file extension is complex sign date, which is just the native data format for HackRF. Um, it's like a, you know, a C file that you'd have out of new radio, except with lower resolution because that's cheaper than an expensive user radio. Um, so the point where we actually start looking at the details of the signal using in spectrum, um, So uh, some of you may have seen in Spectrum from, it might have actually been the first of these. Someone did a quick yes, walk through with that. Um, from SDR so um, 
Inspectrum is a tool for analyzing static captures. Uh, it would be nice if it had some ability to deal with live capture, but it doesn't. Um, the, uh, so uh, it's determined the file contents from the CS8 uh, file extension. Uh, because the file formats are really dumb, there's no information about um, sample rate in there. So we've got to manually set the sample rate so Inspectrum knows Store it in Zadders. Um, so here we've got, okay, so this is basically a waterfall display like you'd see in GQRX, but arranged horizontally. That big line through the middle is the DC spike from the HackRF. So scrolling through time, we see, and so this is a, a series of, um, I'll call them packets, but they barely deserve the name, um, per press um, of the button. So one, uh, ah, because the ring thing charges a cap and keeps transmitting, all five of those presses I did for ring the bell have actually merged into one big long, uh, that, that's great at the end there. Um, <laughs> and then so here we've got one, two, three, four, five presses on the change tune button. So let's go back to ring. Um, uh, we can enlarge or shrink the FFT, given that this is, well, actually, uh, zoom on the time scale. So this is pretty clearly something based on on-off keying um, rather than FSK, unsurprising given how cheap the device is. Let's just shrink that down a bit to free up some space. Um, so we see a sequence, there's no obvious preamble. Uh, then, we, so that's just like a, a sequence of zero one transmissions that the receiver uses to be notified, hey, there's something coming in um, and potentially do clock synchronization. So there's no obvious preamble here. Uh, we see a sequence of short and long pulses. Um, and each of these, you know, at a at a quick look, seems pretty similar. But so the the interesting features of Inspectrum are difficult to discover. Well, not difficult, but they're non-obvious. So if you right-click on any of the displays, add drive plot, and so a sample plot will add a plot of the um, the specific sample values that have come in um, in the sample file. Amplitude is just amplitude, frequency, whatever. And so these will give you a cursor that you can set over the part of the signal you're interested in. So basically, I've just set this little cursor over the 434 megahertz line where all these signals are. And We've now got a plot of amplitude values just filtered within that range there. So that's basically done a um, frequency shift and band pass to just get us the part we're interested in. Um, these values here are scaled from minus one to one. Uh, and those are fairly clean. If you've got a rougher signal, Actually, if we zoom in, you can see that, you know, the edges aren't, you know, so this is still, um, it's it's capped at a value of one and minus one, but there's, you know, obviously still some analog component here. From the amplitude plot, we can add another drive plot threshold, which just goes, is it above or below zero? And then that gives us a, 
much. I'll zoom back out a bit now. A nice clean series of zero and one values. And then to, from looking at this, you can go, okay, so we've got long and short pulses. You know, you could look at that by hand and go, oh, you know, I'll call that zero, one, zero, 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 blah, 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 whatever. But enable cursors gives us a time domain cursor as opposed to the, the frequency domain cursor up here in the waterfall. Set that to one simple time. And let's expand that out to cover a full one of these transmitted pulses. Um, the edges are both draggable. Line them up. So line up the individual symbol barriers or, you know, symbol um, interval points on the uh, the changes in the transmission. And we can now extract symbols. And what that'll do is pull out the center value for each one of these time intervals and write that out to standard output from Inspectrum, which again, isn't fantastic UI, but it does the job. So this will give us, so in the um, threshold plot, We've got one and zero, so that'll grab the middle one. So that'll be uh, zero, one, zero, 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 one, blah, 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 blah. Extract symbols. And we now see that's in spectrum's gone. Cool. These are what you've asked me to pull out. Also from here, so the. Um, So the uh, symbol rate, so the, the rate shown for the time cursor is the, the full area. So it's from the full area selected. So it's like from here down to here um, period. And then the symbol rate is the, um, the inner parts. So that's, you know, at about 1.2 kilohertz. So I know that this isn't doing rolling codes or anything, but before I knew that, or the way I found that out, or the way I confirmed that, so move on to another instance of the transmitted burst. Again, spread out our 25 symbol long cursor, extract symbols, and because I pressed the button a bunch of times. Let's go along to one deeper in. And again, extract symbols. And then do the same for some of those presses on the second button, which presumably will be uh, and that's fantastic. Um, will be a different um, a different bit pattern. So this, using in spectrum this way, removes a huge amount of messing around with lower level stuff um, to just get the basics of how some devices are communicating that extract symbols. So, okay, so these are the, um, well, I guess what spectrum's pulled out of those um, pulse width modulated on off keying. You see basically everything's the same except those last two that I pulled out for the uh, change tune signal have got a zero bit in this position rather than a one bit. 
Um, at this point, the well, okay. So this is while this looks very much like a binary on-off keying signal. One thing that you might recognize um, if you've dealt with PT2260 hardware before. Um, so the chip in here isn't a PT2260. It's a cheap knockoff, but it uses PT2260 signaling, which is not binary, it's trinary. So for each transmitted symbol, so sorry, for each bit of data you want the chip to generate a transmit signal for, it'll actually accept low as zero, high as one, or floating as a third state. So you actually get three possible transmitted symbols, and these are encoded as two pulses each. So a transmitted zero is two short pulses, a transmitted one is two long pulses, and a, a transmitted float, so the third state is a short then a long pulse. So if we actually, so uh, um, so this is the data sheet for that chip. So the, for each transmitted, uh, is there, yeah, okay. So for each transmitted symbol, so that there's a, um, a, time a time sequence of 120, 1024 clocks on the input. We don't so much care about that, but the transmit time is divided up into eighths where you have either a pulse width of one and then three off or a pulse width of three and then one off. Um, with, yeah, as I said, so too short for a bit zero, too long for a bit one, and then a short long for a float. And then after 24, um, sorry, after 12 symbols worth of data have been transmitted, uh, six address, six data, there's a trailing one pulse and then um, 15 pulse widths of off, um, of off time. Um, actually, I don't care about that anymore. So, in this, we see zero one, that's a floating input, zero bit, zero bit, floating bit, floating bit, floating bit. Um, so those 12, what look like, or those 12 pulses represent um, six trinary or six trits of address data, which is um, float, zero, zero, float, float, float. There's then a, um, a sequence of five one bits transmitted and uh, ring the bell is a one bit, change of tune is a float, um, a float trip. And then this zero, which we read off that final pulse is actually the, um, I guess just the trailer. So there's actually notionally another zero at the end there, but we didn't bother capturing it because it didn't look like interesting data. Um, so having identified the, um, I suppose the data, well, the modulations on off keying, but the data encoding um, as standard PT2260 output, um, the address that's oh, actually, and so the address here of float zero zero float float float. Um, that's just got a bunch of solder blobs um, tying various lines to ground or not. Um, so actually, and the one other thing to point out is having noticed that it's um, PT twenty two sixty. Sorry, twenty six. Anyway, whatever. Um, from the initial look at these um, data packets, we assumed there were uh, 25. 25. 
So, you know, lining up the um, the pulses in Inspectrum's time view, it looks like there's 25, um, 25 pulses. We actually don't care about that trailing one uh, because that's just the trailer. So we go down 24 pulses um, and uh, actually, or if we count, sorry, yeah, the, the pulse pairs, I've not lined that up right at all. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to do it like that. Um, we see, so that's 598 hertz symbol rate for the pulse pairs. Um, presumably that's meant to be 600, but cheap clock. Um, so, uh, so, um, yeah, so I identified 434 megahertz transmit, capture with a little bit of an offset. Those are the apparent bit outputs that came out of, uh, yeah, it's gone now, but that um, came out of Inspectrum. So the, yeah, as I said, the PT2260 encoding, zero, one, or X for floating, and then a trailer bit. So what we see, oh, so if we wanna then transmit this, for each symbol that needs to be transmitted, that's broken up into eight time slice units, where there's a um, a one time slice, two time slices of either zero or one, and then a zero time slice, and then again, a one time slice, two time slices of zero or one, and then a zero time slice. That's really convenient because it means for every trip that we want to transmit, that's a byte for a standard on-off keying. Um, so we can say to transmit a zero, which shows up as a zero, zero in our output here. We wanna transmit that valued byte. So like um, OX88, um, converting the, uh, the captured data to uh, to a trick representation, so the, the PT2260's internal representation, X0, XXX for the address field, and then again, either six ones or five ones and, a, and an X for floating. So uh, the next step to actually um, receive data um, digitally rather than through an SDR process and retransmit using um, using RF cat so yeah that's not an SDR device uh, it's a basically a thin Python shim around a CC 1111 which is a um, Texas instruments uh, radio chip designed for you know sub gigahertz um, lowish rate digital data comms So, um, so I'm using right now um, a RF cap dongle from uh, whoever made these ones. Um, alternatively, the um, the yardstick one from Great Scott um, yeah. has got a better radio on it and also an antenna connector, um, but that sits poorly out of this side port on my laptop, so I'm not using it. Um, but again, over these ranges, none of that matters. Um, so RFCAT ships with a bunch of, well, Python library. So there's a Python library called RFLib that defines everything needed to talk to the dongle. So the dongle runs, the, the hardware's got a radio transceiver um, and a uh, what's the MCU in it? Um, yeah, is it? I think it's like I think it's an eight hundred five one. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I like a, a a dinky little MCU. The firmware running on that is basically just enough to 
send and receive information to and from the computer and to and from the radio. Um, so, uh, so you can either write your own Python and import rflib and talk to the hardware, or for this stage of stuff, there's a command line tool, rfcat, that has minus R for research mode that basically gives you a shell for talking to the radio. So that just goes, hey, have we got a radio attached? Yes, we've got a radio attached, that's great. Um, so yeah, the, the type of things you do with it, so you know, set frequency, set modulation, um, stuff related to setting the um, you know, preamble quality detection, whether there's a sync word, what the sync word is. Um, there's also low level access to the uh, radio control registers in the hardware. Um, I've not needed to mess with any of that yet, but there are certainly scenarios where you're gonna need to, um, and at that point, start wading into the TI documentation for the chips, which is great. Um, so. No. Uh, so, well, that, these aren't the defaults. This is just, hey, here's some stuff you might want to say to the radio. So the defaults, it's da -da 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 -da, gathering all the configuration out of the radio. RFK can't talk to a hacker. No. Um, so it's, the RFCAT command line tool and Python library needs to talk to, um, well, in theory, there's an abstraction layer, but there's no backend other than for devices with the TI CC chipset on them. So out of the box, da, 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 da. Um, by default, it's running 100 megahertz, 2FSK, um, uh, yeah, so no Manchester, no FEC. Um, but, so that's that's entirely not gonna talk to this device. Um, it's, it's just like, here's some, you know, here's some stuff to look at to just get started with what this can do for you. Um, so actually, and one other thing that's nifty about that is, uh, uh, so I don't know if you saw, so I don't know how obvious that is, but there's tab completion, not for method names on the dongle object, but for arguments, um, which if you can never remember exactly what the arguments are, um, makes life a little easier. So uh, I've got some Python here. Um, I'll come back to this top bit in a sec. So basically what we're gonna do is set the frequency to 434 megahertz, crank up the power, because more power is always great. Um, the modem data rate here, so that's eight times the symbol rate that we pulled out of RFCAT because the, um, as far as RFCAT is concerned, it's transmitting eight bits of data to encode every trip that came out of the native encoding of this. Um, ASK one off keying. Um, here I'm setting the, so, as we have seen in some previous talks by other people, um, generally in digital data comms, a packet of data will start with a preamble of just 010101 transitions, and then a synchronization word that can be used maybe as an address field, um, or maybe, you know, in which case you get more discrimination between transmissions that are intended for you or not, um, or I guess just as a, um, 
a guard against deciding, you know, thinking I've got data coming in when there's just some noise that you happen to pick up as matching that um, preamble. So here I'm setting the synchronization word to be, oh, where are we? So AD88. It's the encoding of those first two trits of the transmitted data. So, so the um, the X value, the float value for the first is that bit string when we expand it out to a byte per trip. So that's 8E and then 88 for the um, for the zero. So that zero is encoded as an eight. So we set the sync word to match the, so the, the hardware can only handle either a 16-bit sync word or a 32-bit sync word if it's a 16-bit sync word repeated twice. So rather than setting the full three-byte, three-trip address, um, we just have to use the first two, but that's enough to get some discrimination on the inbound data. And because there's no preamble, normally the, um, the CC Quad 1 uh, won't consider reception to be worth doing unless it sees a, um, a preamble at the start. Because this hardware doesn't do that, uh, PQT is the preamble quality threshold, so we just go set that to zero, don't care. So just doing some basic setup to talk to the radio. Um, This is a point where it turns out that this device is actually a little too dumb for the RF cat to be a great um, tool for talking to it. Um, the the CC Quad One can either, so for reception, you can ignore the preamble, so by setting the preamble quality threshold to zero, and then do packet discrimination based just on the sync word. But if you configure the radio that way, it will always transmit a preamble. This gets confused if it sees a preamble before the data. Or alternatively, you can turn off preamble and sync word, but in that case, you get no discrimination on inbound data. And for on-off keying, that means any old junk is data. Um, so, Basically, we've got two options for how to configure it depending on whether we want to do transmit or receive. And because this hardware is dumb, we can only do one at a time. So I'm going to start by configuring for receive. So the packet length, so the um, sends a 12 symbol transmission, three symbols of address, three symbols of data. That turns into 12 bytes of output through RFCAT. So um, yeah, so if we want to take the sync word out of that, we have 12 trits of data plus one trit of trailer minus two trits of sync word or two bytes of sync word from RFCAT's perspective, which means the packet length is 11. Um, this sets the preamble to be as short as possible. Uh, that's probably actually not necessary in the end. And then uh, modem sync mode says, consider a packet to have come in if you have carrier. So if um, RSSI is above some configurable threshold and 16 of 16 bits of the sync word, which is that initial part of the address match. So, for receive um, and then to actually receive the data. So the, the packet reception is done entirely by, so at this point, having been told at the frequency, that's the data rate, da da da, you know, 11 byte packets. Having been given all of this config, all of the packet reception is done in the radio hardware, done by the, the chip on that. And as a client, as client software, you just say, give me packets, rather than having to determine start and end points and do all of both the, um, 
I suppose, packet detection and symbol synchronization and all of the other stuff. So RF listen, um, we'll just start listening for data and putting out packets when they come in. RF capture does the same thing, but returns all of the packet data in a list so that you use that if you're actually writing software to talk to it rather than just tooling around in a shell. RF receive waits for a packet and then gives you that one packet, the next packet that's in the buffer um, with a one second timeout by default or set in milliseconds. So that will wait five seconds um, and then give you the next packet that it receives during that time. So if we just go to listen, so that's whatever garbage was in the buffers on the chip at the point where we started listening. Well, now we don't have buffers full of garbage. I'm sick of those tunes. So let me just pop the battery out of that before I start pressing buttons again. Um, so that is a bunch of, so that's from a single press of the ring the bell. It's truncated out the sync word because as far as it's aware, that's framing rather than data we're interested in. So we see 88, so that's zero, float, float, float. So that's the last four trits of the address. And then, uh, you know, and then a bunch of ones, the final one, which is the actual data payload, and then the trailer of one short pulse and then, uh, and then silence. Or for the change tune, we see, and it's basically the same packet structure, except for that last trip of data um, is the, so AD is short pulse, long pulse, or, you know, one bit, three bit set, um, which is the floating input. Um, so that's, and again, so this, this garbage down here is just as the cap runs out and it stops transmitting. Um, the change tune doesn't charge the cap. It just stops transmitting when you lift your, you know, when you lift your thumb. So, you know, here it's just going, cool. I've now run out of electricity. Zeros for you. Um, of course, with a more interesting device with more functions in it, alarm codes, activate, deactivate, or who am I? Depending, you know, different inputs for different um, different remotes. There's far more interesting stuff to be seen rather than just one of two simple bit sequences. But that's reception. Have you tried transmitting other codes to your receiver? Uh, no, I did all the original stuff on something that then I realized I couldn't actually bring down. And so this is since Tuesday night. And I just this morning was going, I should have tried sending a bunch of other stuff. Given the way this is wired up, um, I strongly suspect that transmitting a, um, a zero symbol will I'm not sure about the address, but certainly for the data, I strongly suspect that transmitting a zero will be equivalent to a float just as far as the reception goes. Um, my expectation is when the, um, when the receiver goes, drives the line high going, I've got data coming in, here's my stuff. Um, there's one line that if it's driven high, it goes, oh, okay, change the tune. But, um, so for transmit, um, so yeah, actually, uh, no, I won't bother showing that just cause I've probably rambled on for a while so far. So the, um, if we try and transmit with the current radio config here, um, as I said, we get there's a minimum, if, you, if the use of preamble and sync word is enabled in RFCAT, there is a minimum two bytes of preamble and that confuses the receiver. So instead, 
um, for transmit. Um, the packet length is 13, so that's 12 bytes of or six trits of address, six trits of data, one trit of trailer. So packet length 13, sync mode zero, just says no preamble, no sync word, just raw data in, raw data out. And if we start, if we listen here, because there's no discrimination on preamble or sync word, wow, that's a lot of data. Always, there's always something or nothing on the air. Um, and transmit, nothing is synchronized. So there's, you know, here we have, you know, what looks like identifiable data This stuff is probably a transmitted packet, but that is out of synchronization by less than a symbol transmission time. Um, it's useless trying to receive data with no synchronization at all. Um, but in this case, the radio is configured in a way that the receiver will understand. So, um, uh, so that's a string representing the, um, the data for either ring or tune, um, which is just an encoding of stuff that we pulled off the air earlier. List just splits that into individual characters. So just bring those into a couple of variables. Uh, So um, here we just map the symbols, so 0, xxx, blah, 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 textual symbols into a hex representation of those suitable for transmit. Um, and then, so what this is doing is, and you know, Python, whatever. Um, so we take either the ring or the tune data as defined here, and then map that via this dictionary and join um, join the individual um, two character bits back together and be NASCII converted. So now, uh, binary strings that represent those full packets in a um, byte expanded representation uh, of the captured data. Also, because the device is done, you've got to yell at it for a while before it actually hears you. Um, so, just like 20 times, tell it to ring. change tune or whatever. Um, and yeah, so uh, that I guess that's basically what I've got. Um, a lot of this is how to work how to get RF cat to work around a lot of this was how to get RF cat to work around the stupidity of this um, if you're poking at smarter and more interesting devices RF cat is actually a far more appropriate tool um, because the things that it does for you uh, don't confuse the stupid hardware um, so yeah I say look at RF cat look at inspectrum um, a lot of this is covered in, uh, uh, or is that just, 
Um, so that Earl is um, a, well, a write-up of a talk Michael Osmond's done a few times called Rapid Radio Reversing, which basically follows that same path from Capture, Inspectrum, RFCAT. Uh, read that or watch the talks. He's given it a few times, so you'll be able to find video of it from some con or another. Um, play with RFCAT. It's useful for dealing with stuff if you don't want to have to actually do low-level modulation um, and packet management yourself. That's what I've got.